Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Daniel chapter 1. So tonight, we are going to turn our attention to um, the prophecy portion of the book of Daniel. And and we've noted, as we've worked our way through so far, we've looked a lot at the background. Um... A lot of historical details, and you'll, you'll hear even more of that tonight because every bit of it is, is important uh, to what's happening in, in this prophecy. But the major portion of the book of Daniel is prophecy, and most of it comes through from God through Daniel, and that'll be in chapter 7 through, through the end of the book. But there are portions of the first six chapters that have to do with visions and dreams, and it too is prophecy, especially the one that we're going to uh, really focus our attention on tonight. But the prophecy that we're looking at tonight is actually coming through uh, pagan kings. It's important to just keep in mind that regardless of who speaks the prophecy or where it comes from, that it is actually coming from God, and he is the one that is in control. I, I, I hesitate to, to kind of jump into what I'm about to share with you, because I think every week I've made this statement that um, just, just looking at how the book of Daniel, uh, how it breaks down, and you have the six chapters that have to do with historical elements, and then the rest of it is primarily uh, more prophecy, and, and so when I think about that, I'm like, so why? Why did God do it like that? Because even some of the latter chapters come back and, and fit in with, uh, with these earlier uh, historical parts of it. And, and so I, when I look at it, when I think about it, the mix of it to me is important. And I want to, I want to give you a reasoning that, that I thought about as I, as I studied through it for, for tonight. I think about how so many, if not all, of the cults and the false religions in the world, how the focus of them, the information that is given, comes through one individual, and that individual's dreams or visions or whatever it is that they have that they come up with their ideas of their religion. Uh, it always amazes me how people will take and believe the things that, um, that are said by these false prophets and by these cults and these false religions. So the significance to me of something like the book of Daniel is you have got so many people involved in this. I know it's primarily Daniel that is the focus, but you have these historical figures and you have all of this detail, but it's not just the book of Daniel. Because when you take the message of Daniel and then you look at how many of the other prophets prophesied some of the same things, and then as we will see even tonight and especially next week, you see the connection between Daniel and the book of Revelation. And so you've got, you've got information and details that are coming from many different people over a vast amount of years, and yet there's a common theme and a common message within it, and what it simply says to me is this is believable. I mean, there's no other, there's no other way that, that these kind of things could come together because they didn't collaborate on it. There was no Google Docs. It was only God. There was no working together and trying to, uh, to come up with the same message. It is God moving in the hearts and the minds of individuals over so many years of time. And, and just simply what that does to me is it just makes it to me, it's like, man, I can believe everything that is here. It's incredible uh, how God puts his word together and how he accomplishes uh, what he does. In fact, let me show you something. Go to the New Testament book of Second Peter. Chapter 1. And verse 19. Peter says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure. And if I had read the verses just prior to this verse, uh, Peter is talking about the occasion when 
when he and James and John and Jesus went up on the mount called the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was transformed. And it's like God revealed his glory, the, de the deity of Jesus. And Peter witnessed that. He saw, he saw Moses and Elijah, and they were talking about the coming end uh, of, the, of the ministry and the life of Jesus. And so Peter says... And he heard God say, this is my beloved son. And so in verse 19, he says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. And so what that just simply tells me is that when I consider what I find in this book, and I find prophetic passages that say the same thing from different periods of times, time, then what I believe is I can believe this book, right? I can believe everything that God has said in here. And to me, the weight of that is that when you start looking at the prophecies about Jesus, then every one of them were true. The ones that have already been fulfilled and all the ones that are to come, which a lot of what we're looking at is related to that, uh, then I have the confident assurance that I can believe everything. It's a faith builder for me and a trust builder that God is in control and that God is controlling the events of our time. <clears throat> so look at Daniel chapter 1. I want to begin just in verse 17, and then we're going to move to chapter 2. In verse 17, it says, in that period of time where the, Daniel and his three friends are being prepared to serve in the king's personal service. They will be, he'll be, they will be among the wise men uh, in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. And then it says, this, it says this in verse 17. It says, As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. The word knowledge, at least in the New American Standard, says God gave them knowledge. Um, it's, it's one of the most used words in the Old Testament for discernment for knowledge, intimate knowledge, personal knowledge. Um, so it wasn't just information uh, that Daniel and his, his friends had. It was knowledge that God gave them. Now you've got to keep in mind, at the same time that God is giving them this, they are, the effort by the Babylonians is to indoctrinate them uh, with the false teaching and the religion and all the, the philosophy and the worldview of the Babylonians. Uh, but God is giving these young men uh, insight deeper than that. My translation also uses the word intelligence. It's a word that can be defined as the ability to think through a complex arrangement of, arrangement of thoughts resulting in, a wise, in wise dealing and the use of good practical sense. And so the intelligence is to take complex situations or thoughts, to think through them, to ponder them, resulting in wise dealings and decisions that's based in good practical sense. And then it's also said they were given insight, and that word means comprehension or to be able to ponder or to think through something. In other words, in other words God gave them what they needed for the time in which they lived. And, and then God would use them multiple times over that. And again, all you, what you see in this is just the hand of God at work uh, being in control of everything that happens. So this verse sets the stage for what is to follow in the book of Daniel. And it will lead to, um, it will lead to the visions and the dreams and ultimately all the prophecy that is going to come. One of the things that, that made me think of this week as I was preparing for this uh, to tie it into the message Sunday is just to see how God works purposefully, how God works powerfully, and how God is working personally in their lives. Everything God does is according to His plan and according to His purpose, and you'll see that even more and more as we walk our way through it tonight. 
So tonight, we're going to spend a lot of time on one of the dreams and visions, and that is the one that is mentioned in chapter 2. It is, it is one of the most significant passages of prophecy related to uh, the flow of history and the time of history uh, that you'll find in the Bible. And then Daniel 4 and Daniel 5 um, are more personal things that happen to King Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And, and I'm going to mention those things, but I'm going to tie them in to the significance of what happens in the vision that is given in chapter 2. So our focus in chapter 2 um, is about this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had, and we've talked about it, verses 1 through 24 is the actual account where the dream takes place. Um, I didn't realize this until I was studying it. Again, I've read this chapter numerous times uh, as we've been walking our way through this. The dream is not mentioned in the first 24 verses. It's not mentioned until you get to Daniel actually making the interpretation. We're told in the text that the dream was so disturbing uh, to Nebuchadnezzar that, um, that he couldn't sleep, he was restless, he was troubled. And the text tells us that what he did was, when he woke up the next morning, uh, he called all together, all of his uh, wise men, those who could conjure things, those who were astrologers, those who were wise men, and he called on them to give him the insight into what his dream was. The only catch was he wasn't going to tell them the dream. Now, he really wasn't playing games. In fact, one commentary that I read this week made the statement that, you, you know, some, sometimes you wake up from a really disturbing dream and you can't remember the details of the dream. You ever had that happen? Well, that, some, some commentary said that could have been what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He really could not remember. It was just a disturbing dream. And so he not only wanted an interpretation, he wanted somebody to tell him what he, what he had actually dreamed. Regardless, he said, bring them together. And then he said to them, you tell me what the dream was and you give me the interpretation of the dream. Um, the wise men of Babylon uh, were floored. You know, they were like, there is nobody that can do this. Nobody is able to do that kind of thing. And so the king is enraged over that, and he puts out a death sentence to all of his wise men in, in Babylon that they were to be, if they couldn't do it, they were to be killed. And, uh, and that would include Daniel and his three friends. They, it doesn't appear that they were present uh, when all of this was taking place. But all of that sets the stage for what is going to happen uh, in this text. So I want you to look at Daniel chapter 2 and uh, look at verse, verse 28. So no one could interpret the dream. And so one of the chief commanders of the king uh, makes reference that there's a man named Daniel that can. And so Daniel is brought before King Nebuchadnezzar in order to interpret the dream. Verse 28 um, says, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. And so what follows those two verses is Daniel telling him the dream and then giving him the interpretation of it. Look at verses 31 through 35. This is the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. He said, You, O king were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, the statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold 
were crushed all at the same time and became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them so that not a trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so that was his, that was his dream. You'll also notice, beginning in verse 36, is the interpretation. And so verses 36 through, for, through verse 49 follow along. Daniel says, This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beast of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch iron crushes and shatters all things, so that the iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break in piece in the, all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will be not left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its, in, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Let's stop there. What remains will be the king's response uh, to what Daniel says to him. So let's look at the various parts of this vision, this dream uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar had, and let's look at what, what the meaning of it is. The, the interpretation that he gives is that Daniel says that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. He is described as the king of kings. He is the most powerful of all the earthly rulers at the time. In fact, he rules over all. In fact, we've noted uh, earlier, if you go to the book of Habakkuk, where God was saying through Habakkuk that the Babylonians or the Chaldeans were coming, he talks about how ruthless they were, how strong and how powerful, and how they just bowled over anybody that was in their way, and they were conquering anyone uh, that, was, that was in their way. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and the Babylonians only ruled, or in this way, for about 65 years, from 605 B.C. until 539 B.C. But I hope you noticed, as I read through this passage, where his dominance came from. Um, you see it all through the book of Daniel, that it is God who has given him the power. It is God who has given into Nebuchadnezzar's hands um, the people of God. The God of heaven, verse 37 says, the God of heaven has given him the kingdom, the sovereignty, the power, the strength, and the glory. Verse 38 says that the God of heaven has given all into his hands and he has caused Nebuchadnezzar to rule over them all. Um, you will notice as we read through this that what he's talking about are various nations. The second one, in verse 39, he mentions the silver and the bronze. After Nebuchadnezzar, 
the Babylonians will be overthrown by, the, by a third kingdom, and that, third, that second kingdom, rather, will be inferior to, the, to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, but they will overthrow them. The thir- a third kingdom will arise which will rule over them. So history tells us that the second kingdom are the Medes and the Persians. Uh, they formed one group, and they were powerful. They were inferior to the Babylonians, but they overthrew the Babylonians. And, and, and you, you may wonder, well, how on earth could they do that? Because Babylon was so strong. Well, God was in control. And God had told the Babylonians that as sure as they came to power, as certain they would, they would lose their power. And so God brought in uh, the Medes and the Persians. During the Babylonian time, the Medes and the Persians were one group of people. In chapter 5 of Daniel, in verse 31, references made to Darius, who was a king of the Medes. And in chapter 6, verse 28, references made to Cyrus, and he also was prophesied, as we saw uh, earlier in the book of Isaiah. The Medes and the Persians ruled for 200 years, from 539 to 331 B.C. And I know you, you may not have thought you were going to get a history lesson tonight, but I want you to hang on, because when you start piecing all of these things together, and you see how God is powerfully in control accomplishing his purpose, and just wait till we get to the fourth one, and i tell you some things uh, related to that one. In verse 39, after the Medes and the Persians will come the Greeks. This is the third kingdom. Under Alexander the Great, uh, the Greeks would become a world power, and they would continue that way for 185 years, from 331 B.C. Uh, to 146 B.C. In verses 40 through 43, we are told about the iron and the clay, and it represents the fourth kingdom. Daniel describes them as strong as iron, as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron, this conquering nation will crush and break in pieces all other nations. Get this, Rome would be the dominant world power in some fashion from 146 B.C. to A.D. 1476. There's never been another world power like the Roman Empire. And and they're ruling the way that they did, and they represent, um, in some form, this this fourth nation. Again, it's important that you not lose sight of this one fact. That while these kings ruled, God always reigned. There never was a time when God was not in control and that God was not controlling the events of history. He is sovereign, is He not? He is King of kings. He is Lord of Lord. And the one thing that I have, am coming more and more to understand as we've worked our way through the book of Revelation And now just seeing some of the things in the book of Daniel is just to see the greatness of the sovereignty of God and how He is absolutely in control of all that is going on around us. Earthly kings rule, God reigns. Never lose sight of that. And that is not just applicable in days gone by, it is applicable for you and me today. Look at verse 44. Well, let me say this first. In fact, I want you to turn to a New Testament verse. Go to uh, Galatians chapter 4. And verse 4. And Paul is writing about the coming of Jesus. And he says this. He said, when the fullness of time came... God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, I realize that verse has to do with with just the whole plan of God as God worked it out so as He brought about the birth of His Son, Jesus. 
But, but when you think about the timing, who, who was ruling when Jesus was born? Who was the world ruler when Jesus was born? The Romans were. The Greeks, the Greeks contributed what is known as Koine Greek, which is, in my office, when I look at and study the Greek New Testament, it is that language. It's not necessarily, it's a dead language because it's not a spoken language today. But it was the, it was the common language of the world during that time. The, the Greeks brought it in, the Romans kept it, and it was the language that was dominant. Why is that significant? Because it just shows how God was in control and God prepared the way for this common language in order for His Son to be born. You may have remember, you may have remember reading in history about Pax Romana and the period of time under the Romans' rule and the kinds of things that were developed in history under the rule of the Romans, some, some really good things like roads so that travel could take place a whole lot more easily than it could before that. And again, what all of that says is how God is working, even in these, these unchristian, ungodly nations, how God is at work preparing the way so that in the fullness of time, at the very right time, that the Son of God would be born. And God would be using all of this to bring about that plan. What that tells me is, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so what is God doing now in preparation for the coming again of His Son? And we saw much of that in our study of, of the book of Revelation. Look at verse 44 of chapter 2. So Daniel says in the interpretation, he says, in the days of those kings... And then he says that in the days of those kings that God will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put, to an, put an end to all these kingdoms, but itself will endure forever. So this stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, this stone would be a conquering, would be a kingdom that would have no end. Now, for you and me as Christians, and because we have the New Testament and we know about the coming of Christ, it's easy for us to read that and understand what he's talking about is, is the kingdom of God. He's talking, about, he's talking about the very kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. That God will set it up. The question is, is when the timing in which this is being referred to, that this is referring to. So look, look at the verses again. You see back up in verse 40, when he's talking about the fourth kingdom, he says that there's two legs, and then, and then he, there's the toes. And the toes, uh, which would be ten, partly of iron, partly of clay, and what he's describing is, is most likely the kingdom, the, the coalition of leaders that will be ruling during the period of the Antichrist. And so what he's describing here is an event that's when God establishes his kingdom. We learned about this in, in Revelation chapter 20 when he was talking about uh, the millennial reign of Christ, when Christ, the second coming, at the end of the tribulation, Christ returns and establish His kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. And prior to that, in that tribulation period, there will be ten kings that will rule during the tribulation period. And the toes that are described on this statue that he saw is a reference to that period of time when, God will, when they will be destroyed because the kingdom will come in and destroy all the other kingdoms, we'll put them down, and there will be one kingdom and one ruler, and that will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the kingdom that he's talking about. Now, when I first read this, I thought, okay, the, if in the period of the Romans, the kingdom of God that came, when Christ first came, there was the kingdom of God came, but not like it is going to come 
in the millennial reign of Christ. I mean, the kingdom of God is present today, is it not? I mean, we, we are a part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in this world even today, but not like it is going to be when it is the earthly kingdom that is set up and which Christ will rule, which is during uh, the tribulation period of time. We, we noticed this when we were studying the book of Revelation that, that during the, the, um, the tribulation period, these ten kings that will rule um, are described as being a revival of the Roman Empire. Now, I remember when we, when we walked our way through that, I thought, well, I don't really quite understand exactly what they mean. But now looking at, at the book of Daniel, because the Roman Empire was so powerful and so strong, and there literally was a period of peace under the Roman Empire when, where people, even the nation of Israel, though the Romans had their hand on them during the first century, they still had a lot of freedom, and there was a lot of peace that prevailed. There was no war that prevailed basically during that time. And so fast forward to the tribulation period, and, and the revival of that Roman Empire, revival of that, those coalition of nations that will rule, and that will seek to bring peace to the earth, at least in the first three and a half years. But those, those will be taken out of the way and it will take place because of the coming of the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God that will rule during that, that period of time. I hope that makes sense. Um, the, the way I look at it and the way I see it, again, God's in control of all the nations and everything that is happening. The focus, because everything that is described, everything that is described in this statue and uh, and the moving out of the way of these various nations from the Babylonians to the Medes and the Persians to the Greeks and then ultimately the Romans, every bit of that has been fulfilled and taken place. Every bit of it has. The only thing that has not happened yet is the coming of that eternal kingdom that will have no end. And that part will come with the millennial reign of Christ. And so the period of time that Daniel is talking about extends all the way to that, that time um, that we read about in the book of Revelation, the thousand year reign in Revelation chapter 20. And then ultimately, ultimately, after that thousand years and Satan is released and Satan is destroyed and the new heaven and the earth, what's going to happen for all of eternity? There will be no ri rivals to the kingdom of God. God will be king. God will rule and reign on, on earth with no ri rival at all. And in part, that's what Daniel is speaking of and what he is saying in this passage. He summarizes, summarizes it in verse 45. He says, Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And in other words, you can count on that God's going to do what God says he's going to do. I don't know about you, um, that just gives me, that gives me a lot of comfort in the days in which we live. I mean, again, we, we can worry and be concerned about all that's happening from Russia to China to the Koreas to the United States of America. But God is still God, and God is still in control. And God will move nations out of the way, and God will raise up kings, and God will accomplish His purpose. And ultimately, there will come a day that the kingdom of God will be established and God will rule on earth like, like we've never seen before. Now, so the two other visions uh, that you find in the book of Revel in um, Daniel, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, the second dream that he had, you know, where, um, where ultimately he's driven out into the, goes out like an animal and lives out in the, 
for a period of time, it came true. Daniel came in, interpreted the vision for the dream for him. Twelve months later, Nebuchadnezzar's out in the outdoors living outside. Um, it came true. Chapter 5 of Daniel is the vision that Belsh King Belshazzar had where, where he saw the handwriting on the wall. I don't think that we can even comprehend what was going on uh, in that setting with the, the party that was taking place and bringing the, the holy, previously holy instruments and vessels that had been taken from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon and they're worshiping this pagan god and they're using the vessels from the temple of God to be able to do it. And in the midst of that, um, Belshazzar sees this handwriting on the wall. And Daniel is brought in. Um, this is years later. And, and Daniel, one commentary said at this point in Belshazzar, Daniel probably has kind of been in obscurity for about 10 years. But someone reminds Belshazzar about Daniel, and Daniel's brought in. And Daniel interprets the vision and the dream. And tells him what God is saying is your king, you're about to be taken out of the way. And your kingdom is going to fall. And that very night, the Medes and the Persians came in and they overthrew the Babylonians and conquered them. It came true. I mean, doesn't that build your faith? I mean, just the realization that everything that God says, even if we can't put all the little pieces together to make it as clear as we would want it to be, doesn't it build your faith to know that God says, I will move kingdoms out of the way, I will raise up who I want, and I will ultimately establish my own? And seeing God do it over and over and over again, it ought to build our faith, it ought to give us such encouragement that God's in control, and we can trust Him with that. And I would, I would venture to say, what helps us with that is just keeping our focus on God, right? Staying in His Word, reading it, trying to understand it. And as we do, letting it determine how we live our lives, knowing that God is a, is a faithful God. Amen? Let me show you one other verse before we close. Look at Isaiah chapter 46. Verse 9. The prophet says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been have not been done saying my purpose will be established and i will accomplish all my good pleasure let's pray together father i i just thank you god that lord that you are in control and i thank you that you are controlling the events the circumstances the things that are happening god i thank you father that that all that we even see going on in our world today, uh, Lord, that your hand is very active in, in every bit of it. You will accomplish your purpose. Everything you do is with purpose. Everything you do, because you're a powerful God, is done powerfully. And God, you do it to glorify yourself. You do it, God, so that your church, your people, Lord, are your witness and you glorify yourself in and through each of us, and then collectively as your church. I praise you, God, for that. Lord, I pray that our faith will be encouraged. I pray that, that God, as we just read passages that just show your hand at work and just show you, God, fulfilling everything that you have said, I pray that we are encouraged by it. I pray that we're challenged, God, to, to take you at your word and, God, to live and act according to that. May you, Lord, fill us with your spirit. May you work in and through us. God, may you accomplish your purpose through our lives. Lord, how do we fit in to what you have planned? 
What is your, what is your plan, your purpose, your will for each of us? How do we have a part in, God, what you're doing and what you want to do in and through us? Help us, God, to be submissive and yielded and surrendered. Help us to be in the place, God, that you can put your hand on us and accomplish your purpose in and through our lives to your honor and to your glory. Thank you, God, for, your just, for just being so good. Thank you for being trustworthy and giving us such encouragement through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here.